Greetings and welcome to my channel, especially if you are new. Today we will be having an interesting discussion with a guy by the name of Riston. Now I must say, this guy was respectful. He's another one of the guys that I debated from the Christian community that is respectful and very well mannered. I like that. I like that type of atmosphere. Now, I get passionate. I must say, I do get passionate about what I'm teaching. But today, this was an excellent bond that was created. And I hope to have many more discussions along these lines. Hold on to your seat. All right, Riston. And do you want to give us a background on you? Yeah, sure. Uh, I guess I'll share a little bit about my life. Uh, and um, just hold up real talk, quick, uh, man. These people are going nuts. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, oh, oh, Stan Lee. Oh, 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 shiver my timbers. Shut up, man. Man, 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 man. I grew up um, as um, a Christian. Uh, until I was 19 years old, uh, and then I practiced Buddhism, Eastern religions, and I was involved pretty heavily into the New Age for about, um, I'd say, 15 years. Okay. Uh, something like that. Maybe let's just say let's say 12 or 13, and then uh, I became a born again Christian, uh, and I have been for the last about three years now. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. That's good. That's that's really straight to the point. And um, being in another religion is, is pretty different. Um, I haven't heard no one tell me they was involved in Buddhism. Okay. Yeah. So what we're going to do today... Um, is we're going to talk about um, the topic. We're going to try our best to stay on the topic. And the topic is, Jesus did not die for your sins. And what I'm going to do is, I'm going to set a timer. I'm going to give you 20 minutes. And with these 20 minutes, you can try your best to prove that Jesus did die for your sins and I'll do 20 minutes disproving um, that Jesus did not die for your sins and then what we'll do is uh, we'll do questions and answers we'll do like let's say we'll go back and forth with questions you ask a question yeah. And then I'll ask a question. And with these questions, I'll, I just want to tell you from my experience, this is what happens with the questions and answers. A lot of times when people ask a question, they want to try their best to explain it. If you're going to ask a question, give an answer. You don't have to explain your answer because that's going to take time. So what we're going to do is we're going to do questions and answers. If I ask a question, I want an answer. Don't want an interpretation. Just want an answer. Same thing with you. When you ask me a question, I'm going to give you an answer. That saves the time. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to get ready to set my timer. Now, mind you, the topic is Jesus did not die for your sins. And what I want is I want someone to come from the Old Testament showing me something where God is saying Jesus did not die. I mean, I mean, my, I can't push my belief. Uh, proving that Jesus did die for your sins. And if you don't have nothing from the Old Testament, you know, like concrete or whatever, then I need you to make that confession, voice it, and then you can state why you believe it, okay? So um, this is going to be an honesty test, 
a lot of people don't like to be honest and this is going to be an honesty test for you to prove um, that God Almighty says that Jesus is going to die for your sins and I'm starting my timer let me see let me give you a little time real quick do you do you have any questions real quick before no. you get started no I I think that that's uh that's both specific and general yeah that should be enough uh information you also you know want some old testament uh information there yeah I can uh, do my best all right all right so here we have the timer getting ready to start Some of this, uh, you might, uh, you know, as someone who does arguments, might want to, you know, argue about certain points just on different basis. But I'll just lay out the evidence as uh, I understand it, uh, essentially, uh, and I'll give I'll give references here. So uh, basically, uh, the, the way that I came to faith, my testimony is uh, I started looking into a lot of near-death experiences. Uh, I watched uh, one, two, and then I've watched almost a thousand or more at this point. And uh, I've just looked deeply into what happens in the afterlife through that. And because I, I was just wondering, I said, you know, what happens in the afterlife? And just from my research, I've realized that, you know, there is an afterlife. Uh, you know, I thought, you know, you just float around the universe like the ghost. But uh, that's, that was my opinion. Uh, reality hit me like a ton of bricks when I started looking into what people's uh, testimonies are. And before some people say, well, those people might have hallucinated those things or, you know, any, any number of reasons why people uh, would disagree with near-death experiences. You know, I just say that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very rare to have somebody at the point of just near death on a hospital bed and have them all have similar experiences, a lot of times leaving their bodies and seeing things in the room or in different rooms that they've never been in before because they were out of their body, in, in their spirit. And uh, it was evidence for me that, um, you know, and you can, you can question the reliability of near-death experiences, but it is evidence, however uh, strong or weak it is, however you'd like to refute it, you know, I. I just share what, what uh, evidence I've discovered. That's the first thing. Uh, and for me, that is evidence of Jesus' resurrection because um, it's related to his further existence in the afterlife and you know, many other factors like people seeing different things and reporting it back. Uh, so that's just the first thing. So the second thing that really brought me to uh, faith in Jesus because... I really wasn't, uh, you know, someone that's easily convinced, is uh, the math miracles in the Bible. And what do I mean by that? Uh, in the Quran, there are math miracles. As far as I understand, uh, there's a math miracle concerning the number 19. Uh, as far as I know, that's pretty much... And there was, there was one other uh, that I found that was uh, somewhat credible uh, involving the element... Uh, the number for the element of iron and its uh, relationship to the Quran, but it wasn't too overwhelmingly convincing. But the math miracles in the Bible are uh, extraordinary. It's basically every letter in the Hebrew and the Greek have a corresponding number. You add up those numbers, it makes exquisite patterns that are just simple arithmetic and multiplication. Um, certain numbers show up uh, repeatedly and it's, uh, it's very convincing evidence to me that the Bible, through all the manuscripts that have been preserved over the years, uh, truly represent the um, genuine, uncorrupted work of the Bible. Uh, it's, it's further corroboration beyond just all the manuscripts of you know, copies that they have uh, from, I think the earliest was the, uh, what is it, the Sinaiticus, so, something like that. But there's, there's a lot of copies. That's just, that's just uh, one name. And then, uh, 
other uh, evidence that, uh, you know, Jesus in the Bible resurrected from the dead. Uh, there's plenty of examples of Jesus showing up in the Old Testament. Just try to just look up. Even uh, Jesus was uh, the Passover lamb. You know, a lot of times, uh, like when Isaac was sacrificing his son, that was a foreshadowing of Jesus being sacrificed for the sins of the world. But of course, you know, according to the Bible, God stopped him. He held his hand, so he couldn't sacrifice his son. And when in the book of Exodus, it talks about um, a lot of the uh, things in the Bible, uh, you know, how uh, God delivered the people and, you know, he put Jesus on uh, the cross. In the book of Exodus, it talks a lot about, uh, you know, just how all the, all the criteria for the Passover, it, it, Jesus was perfectly fulfilled when he was born of a virgin, according to the Bible, and the Quran agrees with that, and all the other factors, how he was wrapped in swaddling clothes, it says the same words in the same language in the Old Testament. And uh, it's uh, just very, uh, it's, there's so many parallels between the Old and the New Testament that, uh, you know, for instance, it says that if, um, in, it says that if an ox is, uh, you, you know, a gores a person, it's, you have to pay 30 pieces of silver. In the New Testament, it says Jesus was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Uh, and even in the book of Zechariah, chapter 11, verse 12 through 13, it says, uh, you know, throw it to the potter, uh, the silver, you know, the lowly price for which I was paid. Uh, you know, and those are, those are clear references to the betrayal of Jesus. And in terms of specifically the resurrection, uh, I mean, the, the Bible does talk a lot about miracles. Uh, in Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53, those are both foreshadowing of the Messiah. It says, Psalm 22, uh, enthroned as the Holy One. It says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was exactly what uh, he said on the cross. Uh, scorned, he trusts in the Lord, let him deliver him. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls encircle me, of Bashan. And uh, it goes on to explain all the, you know, inner feelings of Jesus, you know, in detail. In the Old Testament of him on the cross. And then also in Isaiah 53... Talks about uh, who has believed it, our message, and it says, uh, you know, he was oppressed and afflicted. He bore our suffering. Also, um, it says in the Old Testament, if uh, you know you see a, a serpent uh, on a pole, look at it, and you will be healed. And serpents are the ubiquitous archetype for evil. And so Jesus, in that moment when he was on the cross, he was, it actually says, he became sin in the New Testament. And so when he became sin, he was, um, suffered the wrath of God in that moment. And that, like I said, was a foreshadowing of when Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness for the Israelites. Um, there's... There's just so many examples. Uh, what are a couple others? So, of just uh, examples. I mean, oh, resurrection. I think uh, Enoch was. It said he walked with God, and then he was no more. Um, you know, he was. And there was this. There's uh, examples in the Old Testament. Elijah went to heal the. Uh, the boy who had been killed, and the widow said to Elijah, oh, you've uh, basically, um, you know, proven that, you know, you're the real deal. Because she was at first distressed. Because her son died, she's like, why did you come here, Elijah? You just brought a curse on us. And then Elijah goes, let me just show you God's power. And then he heals the boy. He was completely dead. 
So I don't know if that's resurrection, but that's raising someone from death to life. And then it says that the boy was raised after being dead for three days. If you look in the Bible, in the Old Testament, a lot of times it'll say this happens such and such after three days. And those are all foreshadowings of the resurrection. And uh, let me see, I have a couple of verses more. See if I can find them without having to scroll through these pictures. Uh, there, so this is Exodus 21:32. Yet an ox, if the ox shall push a manservant or a maidservant, he shall give unto their master thirty shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. That's prophetic. It also says in Exodus 34:20. But the firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb, and if thou redeem him not, then shalt thou break his neck. All the firstborn of thy sons thou shalt redeem, and none shall appear before me empty. So when Jesus rode in to Jerusalem before his resurrection on the donkey, this was a foreshadowed in Exodus. It says the firstling of an ass, which is exactly what he rode in on. And then it said thou shalt redeem him. Redeem as in you know, resurrect, um, break his neck, and then it says, uh, thou shalt redeem the firstborn of thy sons. So it says in the Bible, Jesus was the only begotten son of God. And so he was, uh, you know, the firstborn, uh, the only of, uh, of God, uh, because he was, uh, you know, truly God. And the nature of God, a lot of times to Muslims, is a little confusing because then they say, well, you know, how could God be killed? How could God have died? And all of these sorts, sorts of things, you know, why did he, I don't want to get too far off the topic, but pray to himself, you know. Those are all questions that, um, it's essentially that Jesus is, uh, you know, a, a person, but he's also, in essence, God. He has all the power of God, all the omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence, except for the you know, the span when his essence was confined to his body. And additionally, God the Father can hide inside of God the Son. And he can also, you know, not hide inside God the Son. But the essence remains the same. Just to clear that up, that's how I would explain the Trinity in a very, you know, crude way as best I can. And uh, just a couple of other things to mention. Because the Old Testament shows proof of those couple of things. Um, you know, the, the Bible says, you know, that, you know, to be redeemed, Jesus had to be sinless. And, uh, you know, the, according to the, the Bible, Jesus goes to great lengths talking to the religious leaders and the lawmakers, the Pharisees and the Sadducees at the time, trying to argue with them, trying to explain to them, I have not committed any offenses. When he gets to Pilate, Pilate says, I have not committed any offenses. He said, this man has committed no offenses. And that's significant as proof of the resurrection because uh, you know, people cannot just be raised from the dead unless uh, you know, God grants that ability, that power. Uh, so, but Muhammad was not sinless, really. Uh, and you know, that's basically... And Jesus was born of a virgin according to the Quran. Uh, Muslims would agree with that, but Muhammad was not born of a virgin. Uh, Jesus did many miracles, according to the Quran. Uh, but Muhammad, by his own self-admission, uh, did not do many miracles. Uh, Jesus is coming back to judge the earth. According to the Quran, Muhammad is not. And Jesus is coming back to fight the Antichrist. According to the Quran, Muhammad is not actually. It's funny that uh, you know Muslims would um, question the resurrection of Jesus because, according to the Quran, Jesus was ri risen from the dead. Uh, it's said that he didn't suffer on the cross, but it is said that he did. He was raised from the dead and was resurrected, and Muhammad was not. Uh, yes, in the Quran it says that instead of dying on the cross, Jesus, a substitute, was put in for him. Uh, and the, the disguised person was the one who suffered the, the, the cross. But uh, 
Um, that is different from the Bible. And, uh, you know, who, you know, Jesus went to heaven in their body, according to the Quran. But Muhammad, there's no record of that. And it says in the Quran that Jesus uh, created a pigeon from spit in the dirt, and he made life, according to the Quran. And who's the only one who can make life? God. And Muhammad did not. Uh, and also another evidence that Jesus was resurrected is simply because I have the Holy Spirit. And it says in the Bible, if you uh, want evidence that I have, have, have reached the throne of God, I'm going to send my Holy Spirit down. And so actually I sometimes will get a word of knowledge or I'll have prophetic dreams that come true. And ever since I was born again by the fire of God, I have that evidence inside of me personally. I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, who is God, you know, as far as I understand. And that might not be the best apologetic evidence, but I'm just presenting evidence of his resurrection as the best that I can. And I remember, you know, practicing religion, but religion was traditions, was rules, regulations. It wasn't about a, a relationship. If you, so long as you follow laws, you can't really know the resurrection because laws, you either follow them or if you break them, you're done. They don't love you. In a relationship, you could be loved. So I can know love that Jesus had because he's, a, he's alive, he's a person, I have a relationship with him. But just following laws, praying five times a day, um, you know, through tradition, never really brought that personal relationship of understanding of the resurrection, like just, you know, praying the simple sinner's prayer, which isn't in the Bible, but just, Jesus, forgive me, I want to encounter you. That simple prayer, you know, has uh, changed a lot of people's minds about the resurrection. I see miracles happen in our church, healings, demons cast out of people speaking in tongues, prophetic utterances, and, uh, you know, not too much in other religions. Uh, you know, even people, like I said, near-death experiences. Some people, you know, being raised from the dead. And I, I, I have evidence to support this source material. Uh, you know, examples, specific uh, testimonies and uh, corroborating evidence of that. Uh, you know, in, uh, in the Bible, uh, you know, Jesus, he says, love your enemies. And the Quran... Uh, chapter 5, verse 90, 69, in the Quran, chapter 9, verse 5, and Quran, chapter 66, verse 9, kind of says the opposite. Uh, you know, don't love your enemies. And the Holy Bible, uh, you know, it's in the Quran says that God cannot lie. But the Quran says the Bible is true. It, you know, and, and it's so, so because the Bible says that what the Quran says, it contradicts it, either the Bible is corrupt or the Quran is false. If, if the Bible is corrupt and God cannot lie or be corrupted, then Islam is false. So basically by that measure, I would say Islam is false if it purports the Bible is true or that the Bible cannot be corrupted or God cannot lie. And, you know, there's other things like, you know, Muhammad's real name, is not Muhammad, that's a title. Uh, his real name is uh, Kutham. And uh, there's other verses uh, in the Quran, like uh, Quran chapter 4, verse 171, where it says, essentially Jesus is the word of God, and it talks about the Trinity, and there's, for clarity, a parenthetical line about Jesus being a messenger uh, that was later added. So uh, that's all evidence uh, of um, you know, the the Bible, um, you know, uh, just, um, you know, being true in those regards. Um, you know, the, the Old Testament, uh, just more examples of, of Jesus' resurrection, uh, plenty of, plenty of claims where Jesus, uh, like, I'll try to look into this Passover lamb, the, uh, the criteria for the Passover lamb. All right, you got 11 and a half minutes. Okay. And I'll just keep sharing some more. You know, because 
Let me see this. Uh, qualifications of the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Exodus 12, uh, chapter 12, verse 5, and chapter 13, verse 2. Sanctify unto me all the firstborn. Whosoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both man and beast, it is mine. So, and then it also says, uh, The death of the lamb, and you shall keep it unto the fourteenth day of the same month, the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening, just like how Jesus died. And also, um, you know, the, the seven Jewish feasts, the feast of... Um, the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits, and then the Feast of Pentecost were all fulfilled in Jesus' first coming. Um, so those, the Feast of First Fruits is uh, evidence of Jesus' resurrection, um, and the Feast of Passover is when Jesus was crucified, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is when Jesus was buried in the tomb, and the Feast of First Fruits aligns perfectly with when Jesus was resurrected, and then the Feast of Pentecost uh, occurs 50 days for the namesake, eponymous Penta, 50. Uh, and then the Holy Spirit descended on the uh, apostles and the followers, disciples in the book of Acts. And now there's going to be three more Jewish feasts uh, to come in the, uh, in the fall. Those were the spring, the four spring feasts, and the, there's seven total, so three in the fall yet to be fulfilled. Uh, and because the first four are evidence uh, of having existed in the Old Testament and then in the New Testament. Um, they were, they were, the Old Testament was a shadow of the New Testament. And then when Jesus fulfilled those first four feasts, the Feast of Trumpets, which is going to be uh, this year, late September, next year, October 2nd, is going to be the rapture. And if you look at uh, a lot of the information, it's, uh, it's going to be the rapture of the church and then the Feast of Atonement is going to be at the end of the tribulation and that's going to be when all the Jewish people look on the Messiah and they see whom they pierced and they repent and they are saved but after many die uh, and, you know, and, and then the Feast of Tabernacles is a symbolic of the shadow of Christ's thousand year millennial reign to come so those are all significant because they point to the resurrection um, and you shall, it says in Exodus chapter 12, verse 46, neither shall you break a bone thereof, uh, so that the scripture might be fulfilled in John 19:36, where it says, no bone of his shall be broken. So, I mean, if that was written a thousand, well, Moses lived, uh, I think, 1,500 B.C., if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so, it was written almost 2,000 years, essentially, before Jesus was born. And uh, according to the Bible and the records, uh, he had not uh, had his bones broken. And a lot of people, they'll question the New Testament canon. They will say, you know, how do we know that, you know, it's all legitimate? But really, the, the canon, or that, you know, no one had their hands in corrupting it, uh, you know, a lot of the canon was solidified pretty much as soon as it was finished. Although we don't have a lot of the original copy, but we have copies of copies, and they, they match up. The copies match up. Which, if you had the original copy, you could easily manipulate the source information, but God was smart, and so he kept... A lot of the information, um, you know, from being able to be obtained out of source, and the copies all uh, corroborate, you know, with very few substantive differences. Uh, you know, any 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 corruption, any possible corruption in the words of the Bible, not to mention the math patterns that can absolutely prove the Bibles without error that it's inerrant. Because uh, even even uh, just a simple example of uh, math, another math miracle, because like I said, there's tens of thousands of them, but uh, the shortest verse in the Bible is Psalm 117. The longest 
I'm sorry, the shortest chapter in the Bible is Psalm 117. The longest chapter in the Bible is Psalm 119. And the middle chapter is Psalm 118. And the middle verse is verse 8. And it's just interesting how for the, for the whole Bible, that is true. And uh, that the shortest chapter and the longest chapter abut the middle chapter of the Bible because if you exclude the New Testament, then that pattern wouldn't exist. But if you incorporate it, because it is one corpus, uh, it's essentially uh, showing that the, that the Bible you know, has that foresight of proving itself through this particular uh, math evidence. And additionally, the, you know, every letter in the Bible is perfect. Not even just every uh, you know, word or chapter. All the books have a specific order. Um, it's all inspired by the Holy Spirit. Um, and even, like, you know, uh, you would say, like, you know, God, you know, how could he be a man? I used to ask that too, but who's to say God can't limit himself, really? You have an almighty creator. Uh, it says that in the Bible, it's a bit of a mystery. I'll just read this uh, real quick. Um, one moment. So, it's... What is it? Sorry if I'm a little unorganized. I don't know if I have it there, but... So, that, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a mystery, the, uh, the way that God was in, in a body for a period of time. He humbled himself, taking on human likeness, is what the Bible says. Um, and let me just see this. Uh, if I could look this up on the fly. It's busy. Whoever is... Um, let's see if I can find this, because... I have my notes here. A couple of notes. So, yeah, this, the, I mean, the Holy Trinity, uh, you know, it's essentially, it's, it's different. There's no example of it on earth. Like, you could say, you know, the Holy Trinity is like, you know, solid, liquid, and gas. Or, like, length, width, and height. Or past, present, and future. You know, you could say that, you know, the Holy Trinity is like, you know, an apple, you know, uh, skin, the apple flesh, and the apple core. But the thing is that God is, is one God in three persons. It's, it's tricky for us to understand. There's no example of it that's absolutely perfect that can show that. Also, the, um, the way that, you know, the name for God in, in the Bible uh, is yud heh vav -Hey, and the word yod means hand. The word hey means to look. And the word vav means nail. And that word is the tetragrammaton used more than 6,800 times in the Bible. And it is, it is a reference to Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, to his crucifixion. It's, it's saying the hand look, the nail look. If you... Uh, interpret the Jewish pictograms that comprise the word itself. So God is constantly reminding us in the Old Testament that he's Jesus, that he's God, that his name would not be revealed when Moses asked him, what's your name? He said, I am. And in the Bible, uh, in the book of Revelation, and the many places he said, when the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty, and also that word yud heh vav -Hey comprises um, a combination of the, four, of the three Hebrew words that mean is, was, and will be. And so that, that when Jesus is saying, I was, is, and will come, in the book of Revelation chapter 1 verse 8, he is proclaiming to be God. Um, Alpha and the Omega, he says... Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. He says that in John chapter 8, verse 58. Commonly mistranslated because the King James is um, 
I think doesn't doesn't actually say I am, but that is the actual translation. He says I am there. Uh, there's literally dozens of examples of Jesus just standing up there and proclaiming to be God, just walking around healing people, getting raised from the dead. He says, uh, "What else?" This. Yeah, I. Um. You know the 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 Old Testament is constantly foreshadowing. Uh, the New Testament, it's, he, he, the, you know, just like they had to kill all the animals to atone for their sins, uh, Jesus was the final atonement. He was the uh, he was the last needed thing that had to die in order to make up for the evils of the world. Thirty seconds. Sure, and uh, yeah, Deuteronomy eighteen verse eight, eighteen through nineteen, talks about Yeshua. And uh, in, in the, there's a plural and singular hint of God in the first verse of the Bible, Genesis 1.1. It's uh, plural in form, singular in meaning. One essence, three people. It's a hint to God uh, being one essence and three persons. All right, there you have it. All right. So... That was 30 minutes, and now I'm going to do 30 minutes, and then we'll go with the Q&A, all right? All right. Thirty minutes starting. Okay, so I want to start with Deuteronomy chapter... Actually, Numbers 23, 19. It reads, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Have he said, and shall he not do it? Or have he spoken, and shall he not make it good? So according to the law of Moses, now Moses, out of all of the prophets, was the only prophet whom God wrote his book with his own finger. And from the finger of God, coming from the book of Moses, and this is the books that most Christians stay away from. When they talk about Jesus dying for their sins, they never go to Moses because Moses is totally against that as well as Jesus being God. So that is the strongest prophet we have According to the Bible, even Jesus said he didn't come to destroy what Moses wrote. Then I'm going to give you another scripture from another prophet. This is going to be Samuel. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 3 that not one of his words touched the ground. So here we have Moses, the man who got the book that was written by God's very own finger. And he said that God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man. And Jesus identified as the son of man about 82 times in the New Testament. So then we have 1 Samuel 15, 29. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. This is a perfect precept with Numbers 23, 19. How God is not a man. I'm going to give you another scripture from another prophet. The Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. This is going to be Hosea 11.9. I will not execute the fierceness of mine anger. I will not return to destroy Ephraim. For I am God and not man. Now here we have three times. God is saying he is not a man. Now the apostate or apostle, self-proclaimed apostle, I call him the wolf in sheep clothing. He says that God is immortal. That means God is untouchable by death. Now I want to go to Ezekiel chapter 28. Because in this verse in scripture, 
you'll see some amazing qualities about God and about man. In verse 9, it reads, Will you say before him that slays you, I am God? But you shall be a man and know God in the hand of him that slays you. So that's in perfect agreement with God being immortal. Now, man dies. Man dies. That's the difference between God and man. Man dies. According to the Christians, Jesus died. Okay? He was murdered. Okay? However you put it, you can say he gave up his life, you know, whatever, however you put it, he was killed, according to the Christians. Now, the Bible says, again, I want to read that. Will you say before him that slays you, I am God, but you shall be a man and know God in the hand of him that slays you. Now, one of the reasons why God wanted to show his power towards Pharaoh is because the Pharaohs thought they were gods. They thought they were God on earth and God destroyed Pharaoh. Okay, he destroyed his firstborn son and we'll get into that. Also, according to the Bible, God knows everything. He's all powerful. He's all knowing. In the Quran, he's all knowing. In Mark 13, 32, it reads, But of that day and that hour no man knoweth, no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. So if Jesus is God, how come he doesn't know everything? Why is he calling himself the Son of Man if he's God Almighty? And could it be when he said that before Abraham was I am, he was speaking in the person of God. Many times we read Bible scriptures and when you read it, you read it in the person of God. Like for instance, in Joel 2.27, he says, for I am the God of Israel and none else. When he said, when I say that, just because I'm saying it in the person of God, it doesn't mean that I am God. Also, I want to deal with the fact on Jesus coming back as a just ruler. Now, I heard it said that just because Jesus had a virgin birth, that means he's God. The reason why Jesus had a virgin birth is because Jesus will return as a just ruler. And in order to do that, he had to be born miraculously because God can't lie. In Jeremiah 22 verse 30, it reads, Thus saith the Lord, Write ye this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper sitting upon the throne of David and ruling anymore in Judah. Now, this is speaking of Jeconias. Jeconias is in the genealogy of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 1. Now, he made a promise that there would be no more kings coming out of the nation of Israel. And let me tell you something, God meant that promise because until, even when he made that prophecy, there has been no more kings in Israel. Even when Jesus came, Pilate said, aren't you the king? And Jesus simply said, for this cause I was born to bear witness of the truth. He said, you are saying that. When they took him and tried to make him king by force, he went into a mountain and hid in John chapter 6. Jesus Christ is nothing like Moses at all, okay? The only prophet of history who can be remotely compared to Moses is the prophet Muhammad, and that is said by a Christian scholar. A Christian scholar has a dictionary, James L. Dow, and it talks about the only prophet in history who can be Compared to Moses is the prophet Mohammed. Peace and blessings be upon him. Now we want to talk about the lies in the Bible. Now I heard you say that the Bible is perfect. Every letter is perfect. Now I want to go to first, actually I'll go to 2 Samuel chapter 10, 18. It says that David killed 700 characters. 
okay, and 40,000 horsemen. But if you go to Chronicles, which is the same story, it just has different details in this book that's not in the Kings and the book of Samuel. So the same story is in 1 Chronicles 19, 18. And it reads that David killed 7,000 characters and 40,000 foot soldiers. Now, and it spells Shobach's name different than in Samuel, but you know what, that's a minor error. Although you said every word was by the Holy Spirit and you know God is perfect and it, and it was inspired by the Holy Spirit, I'll, I'll dismiss that one. But how are we going to mix up David killing 700 characters to 7,000? Not only that, how did he kill 40,000 horsemen and then it says he killed 40,000 horsemen? footmen. This is a huge contradiction because they both can't be true. They both can't be true. Also in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 36 and 39 it says Jehoiachin was 8 years old when he began to reign. Then in 2 Kings 24 8 it says that he was 18 years old when he began to reign. Which one is right because they both can't be true. If we go to the genealogy of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 1 it talks about his genealogy. However if you go to 2 Chronicles if you go to the book of Chronicles chapter 3 you'll see the genealogy of David and we see that four men's names are missing from the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1 that is Ahaziah, Joash, Amaziah and Joachim these men are missing from the genealogy of Jesus Christ so when Matthew says in verse 17 that all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations and from David to the carrying away of Babylon are 14 generations that is a lie that is a complete lie that whole thing is off oh also we want to talk about yeast we want to talk about bread now Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16 verse 12 then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of the bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, I ask Christians all the time, and they have no answer. Why did Jesus make a metaphor? He made a metaphor because he wasn't talking about yeast. He wasn't talking about leaven in the actual bread but he was talking about the leaven of the Pharisees he was talking about the teachings of the Pharisees now Paul was a Pharisee he was the son of a Pharisee he was from the tribe of Benjamin the symbol is the wolf now the first king Saul in the Bible was wicked God quit talking to him. He was evil. He was chasing poor little David all around trying to kill him. He went from killing witches to believing in witches. And when he went to go and inquire of a witch, the woman was afraid. She said, well, Saul has been killing the witches, I'm paraphrasing. And so he promised to God that he wouldn't kill her, even though the Bible says in Exodus that you are not supposed to suffer a witch to live. This man is a picture of the New Testament, wolf in sheep clothing. He goes by the name of Paul. He is the main apostate, apostle, self-proclaimed apostle, talking about Jesus being crucified. He went from killing Christians to becoming the founder of Christianity. This man's life is seen in a type and a shadow in the life of King Saul. They were afraid of Paul. They didn't believe he was a Christian. His life is an exact parallel to Saul. Now, Joseph has about 60 parallels with the Christian and the Christians would agree because most smart Christians, I would say sort of smart, they believe in types and shadows. They'll tell you that Joseph's life and Jesus' life is very similar. However, when it comes to the death of Jesus, they don't want to go with the type and shadow of Joseph. Joseph was not murdered. It was a big lie. It was a huge lie. Something else was killed in his place. It was a kid goat. His father believed that he was dead. 
But what happened? Oh, he was governor in Pharaoh's kingdom. And it's the same thing. Remember, he was sold to the Ishmaelites. He was sold to the Ishmaelites. And isn't it amazing that the Ishmaelites are the ones with the truth about what really happened to Jesus? Neither was he killed nor crucified, for Allah took him. Okay, so most people would agree with everything else about Joseph being 30, Jesus being 30, and Jesus being hated by his brothers, and, bro and Joseph being hated by his brother, and the pieces of silver, and all these other parallels they would agree with but when it comes to the death of Joseph which was a picture it was to guard us from corruption your Bible says in Ecclesiastes 1 9 that there's nothing new under the sun history simply repeats itself and it repeats itself and it repeats itself and the true story about what really happened to Jesus is seen in the life of Joseph going on now I just tackled Bible corruption but I want a scripture Christians love telling you what stuff mean if you notice I'm just telling you what the Bible says I'm not going into mathematics I'm not going into numerology I'm not doing none of these different weird uh, types of stuff where it's so hard that a child can't get it. I'm trying to present the truth in a way that a child can understand it. Okay, and so what I want to do is show you what the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 8 verse 8 and 9. It reads, how do you say we are wise? And the law of the Lord is with us. Lo, certainly in vain made he it. What did he make in vain? The law. Why? I'll tell you why. It says, the pen of the scribes is in vain. Other translations read, the pen of the scribes have falsified the text. The other, the other translation says, the pen of the scribes that has been writing lies. They have been writing lies. This is what the Bible says. I'm going to read it again. How do you say we are wise? How do you say the law of the Lord is with us? Lo, certainly in vain made he it. Why? The pen of the scribes is in vain. Verse 9. The wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. Lo, they have rejected the word of the Lord. Now this is a letter talking about scribes. Scribes were the one who wrote the text. Now amazingly in the Bible the book of Hebrews is unknown. There's about 18 authors in the 66 books of the Bible and I don't even want to get on the Apocrypha okay that are all unknown authors. Who wrote Job? Who wrote Hebrews? It's unknown but it's from God now Moses is quite different. That's why Moses, he got his book from God Almighty. God wrote the law with his very own finger. And in the book of his law, he reads, I'm going to read actually in Deuteronomy 24, 16, the fathers shall not be put to death for the children. Wow. Neither shall the children be put to death for the father. Now we have a huge problem. We have a huge problem in the New Testament because we know in Islam that Jesus was born of a virgin. Unlike the Christians, only 66% of Christians, not counting the Israelite camps, believe that Jesus is born of a virgin. So most of the Muslims believe more that Jesus was born of a virgin than even the Christians. And going on, what I want to show you is Joseph is also called the father. When Mary was looking for Jesus, she said, me and your father was looking for you. So what you're trying to tell me is that Jesus died for Joseph? That Jesus paid for the sins of all mankind when the Bible says in Deuteronomy 24 16 that the son shall not pay for the sins of the father this is a huge contradiction but hold up I don't want to do the island scriptures you know they'll, they'll take Christians will take one scriptures and build a whole mountain on it they'll take uh, I'm the way the truth and the life and they ain't got no other reference where it says it exactly like that and they will build a tower on it. So I'm going to show you another reference. Mind you, I just gave you Deuteronomy 24, 16. Now I want to go to 2 Chronicles. Yeah. Chapter 25. And it reads, 
Verse 4, but he slew not their children, but did as it is written in the law in the book of Moses, where the Lord commanded, saying, the fathers shall not die for the children, neither shall the children die for the fathers, but every man shall die for his own sins. Now that is seen in 2 Kings chapter 14, that is seen also... Let me get you another scripture because I like to have everything confirmed in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let me give you Ezekiel. Yeah, Ezekiel chapter 18. Let's start at verse 19. Let's see where Christianity started. Verse 19, it says, yet say you. God is saying, yet say you. Why? Doth not the son bear the iniquity of the father? Now that word iniquity means sin. So I'm going to read it again. Why does not the son bear the sin of the father? That's what the children of Israel wanted. The children of Israel wanted the son to pay for their sins. Going on. When the son have done that which is lawful and right. Now we would agree that Jesus did, what just, did that which is right. You would say that he has never sinned. Well, let's keep going. And have kept all my statutes and have done them, he shall surely live. So if a righteous man is keeping God's commandments, he's not going to die. He's going to live. But if a wicked man does that which is wicked, he is going to die. Now that teaching came from the ancient Israelites. And guess who believed that way? The Pharisees. That's why Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Because Paul was a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. And he taught that garbage. He taught the justifying of the wicked. God tells you to never slay the righteous. Okay, he will never, ever let the wicked get away. God is angry with the wicked every day. And that teaching of justifying the wicked came from the ancient Israelites. And Paul took off with that false teaching. Verse 20, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now this is the third time. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. The son shall not pay for the sins of the father. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. Well, what the hell happened in the New Testament? Amazing. Christians have no answers for that. Now I want to go to Malachi. Because right before the book of Matthew, we have a book called Malachi. Malachi means messenger. In other words, if you was to look at your Bible, guess who's the real last messenger? Malachi because there's no mention of thus saith the Lord in the New Testament there's no mention of the word of the Lord have spoken there's no mention that the word of the Lord has come to me hell the New Testament is not even written in the Jews language it's written in Greek it's written in the same language of people who have forced Christianity on our people for years not just us but the Native Americans it is written in our enemies language Okay, Jesus spoke Aramaic. So how is the New Testament written in Greek? Amazing. I don't know. So the God of the Bible, the last time he spoke was in the book of Malachi. And what does he say in Malachi? Malachi chapter 4 verse 4. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant. Now, amazingly, this whole time. You never said anything about Moses. Moses has nothing to do with anybody dying for anybody's sins. Moses was against it. That's why in the book of Revelations, the song of Moses is sung first. Okay? The song of Moses will testify against all people who believe that Jesus died for their sins. Now going on in verse Six, it reads, and he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Now, what does that mean? The son is going to be happy and the father is going to be happy. You know why? Because they're not going to have to pay for one another's sins. And that's what we do in Islam. We don't believe that Jesus died for nobody's sins. Everyone is going to be held accountable for their actions just like the God of the Bible just like the God who authored Ezekiel just like the God who inspired Moses just like the God who inspired the book of Kings 
all throughout the whole Old Testament to the book of Malachi, God is telling us to remember the law of Moses and it is going into the father's paying for the son's sins and the son's paying for the father's sins. Now I want to go to Malachi chapter 3 verse 6. It reads, for I am the Lord. I change not. God doesn't change. The way of the Lord is if you are sinning, if you are doing wicked, you're going to die. But if you are righteous, if you're keeping the commandments, you're going to live. Now, Christians say, oh, only Jesus was perfect. Only Jesus was perfect. There's no one good. Well, Noah was perfect. Job was perfect. Daniel was a righteous man. It said he had an excellent spirit within him. All the prophets were prophets because they were righteous men. Going on with my scripture, it says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Now, I've asked Christians what this means, and they are, they're clueless. What does that mean? That actually means that the sons of Jacob are not consumed. You know why? Because he is not going to make them pay for what their fathers did. Read through the book of Kings. Every child that was king had an opportunity to do right or to do evil. God gave everybody a chance. And if we go back to Ezekiel chapter 8, I call it easy kill. I call the book of Ezekiel easy kill because that's how you kill a Christian talking about Jesus died for their sins. When you go to Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 1, first off it says the word of the Lord came again unto me. Is that mentioned in the New Testament? Nope. Nope. It's not in there. The word of the Lord came unto me again. And this is what God Almighty says. What mean you that you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge? In other words, why are you constantly complain to complaining, talking about just because of what your father did, you're going to suffer? This is what the children of Israel was doing in Babylon. They thought they were going into captivity because of what their fathers did. But what did Jeremiah do? He showed up like the way, the truth, and the light. Because Jeremiah gave that small, that young generation an opportunity to repent. He told them if they would repent, then they would not go into Babylon. Because God quit judging the fathers or the sons based on what the fathers have done. So going on, he says in verse 3, as I live, and I believe the Lord is alive, saith the Lord, you shall not have an occasion anymore to use this proverb in Israel. You're not going to be able to say that garbage no, no more because in verse 4 it reads, Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the sin, soul of the Son, rather, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The Father and the Son, both of those souls belong to the Lord. And God Almighty says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. That's God's way. That is the way of the Lord. Looking at my time, I got three minutes. So we see that this is the way of the Lord. Now I want to go back to my notes and look a bit and see a few things. Oh yeah, when the children of Israel were getting ready to come out of bondage, God killed the firstborn. Now notice, I said I believe. I'm not going to sit up here and, and, and try to tell you something that's in the Bible that's not in the Bible. Now, I teach type and shadows, so I see things through metaphors, okay? The Jesus of the, of the New Testament is not mentioned nowhere in the Old Testament, but Christians claim Jesus in all these Old Testament scriptures, even though the name Jesus is not mentioned one time in it. Now, I believe the killing of the firstborn is going into how Jesus will have to die at the last day according to the Quran. Okay? Now, in the Quran, it talks about God causing Jesus to die. A lot of people who study the Quran, they get confused. God rose Jesus up alive. Okay? It says he took him up alive. And it also talks about causing him to die. And I truly believe 
That is a picture of the killing of the firstborn. The children of Israel were told not to eat bread with yeast in it. What is the bread with yeast? The teaching that somebody died and rose again for your sins. Now the Christians call the Bible the bread. They, they, they even have little pamphlets called daily bread. Daily bread. Now we know from the Bible, Jesus said man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So we know that the bread represents the word. And the reason why the children of Israel were told that same night, when he was killing the firstborns, not to eat bread with yeast. Now think about it in Islam, when we pray, the only time we are forbidden to pray for the most part is when the sun is rising. No, no, that's, that's forbidding. That's going into the beginning. God told the children of Israel not to eat bread with yeast. They couldn't even have it in their house. If they had it in their house, you know what, was, you know what would happen? They would be cut off from the people. Now, Paul is the, the apostate who teaches that Pharisees doctrine. The Pharisees had funky beliefs regarding the resurrection. They believed in the resurrection, but they didn't believe in it according to the way Jesus believed in it. They believed in it according to their ancestors. And Paul is the wolf in sheep clothing. Paul is the Antichrist. He came in the spirit of Antichrist. And his teachings clash with the teachings of James. His teachings clash with the teachings of Jesus. And most definitely, I'm done, his teachings clash with the teachings of the Father God. And that is in your very own Bible. I got four seconds left, but I don't need it. Now, it's time for our Q&A. If you want to ask the question first, you can ask the question first, or I can ask the question first. Sure, I mean, I, I suppose uh, I can ask questions really just... Uh, and we're on the topic, because this is the yeah. thing. A lot of people get in their feelings, and they want to throw low blows in the fight. You know, they want to bring up Muhammad's reproach, and they want to... You be in a boxing ring, they want to hit you in the low area. We're, we're on the topic... If you want another topic that you, you, you feel like you want to talk about, we can talk about whatever topic you, we, you want to, and we can do something. But right now, I want to stay on the topic of Jesus not dying for your sins, or in your case, you believe Jesus did die for our sins. Yeah, I mean, just, just right off the bat, like... Uh I mean, a number. I wrote down just notes on what you were just talking about. Everything, All right. but it, essentially, I did. I did quote a number of verses from the Torah, first five books of the Bible, where Moses wrote those books, where he does show shadows of Christ. I, I mentioned uh, Deuteronomy uh, eighteen, I think I said, uh, but uh, also um, a couple of contradictions that you mentioned. Second uh, Samuel. Uh, chapter 10 verse 18 where David killed the 700 charioteers and the horsemen and it mentions stalls and horses and then in 1st Chronicles 19 18 it kills 7,000 and 40,000 soldiers if you read it that's actually uh, a flub of the translation in a lot of ways and, and because what it says in um, I, I don't know which version but it's it's a matter of the, the issue is that the charioteers are the, the people on the horses, and actually each chariot had ten horses attached to it, and the so and the, it's the same it's it's the same discrepancy with the the other thing. It, it can be understood if you if you if you like you know hear the counter argument to it, and also in Jehoiachin uh, being eight or eighteen, uh, I was having a discussion about that with someone recently. Uh, it, it really is a matter. There's a couple of different explanations that are potentially <laughs> okay, man. All right, but when there's you over a dozen of them, but those you brought up, careful, but, but you those, those okay. can be explained. But you brought up the caretiers, okay? It says he killed forty thousand horsemen. Then it says forty thousand footmen. Did you look at that part? Well, horsemen and then footmen. I mean. 
I, yeah. Those are two different horse riding horseback and on foot is two different things. And it said 700 characters in one and it said 7000 in the other. And you said that God is perfect with his letters and it even spells Shopot's name different in the next in the uh, in Chronicles. So that is an apparent I, that is an apparent contradiction. Yeah, I, there's well, three I mean, different just, things wrong with that verse. There's a lot of different um, texts of Old and New Testament that have different names. That, that, obviously, this is from book to book. It's lo it's um, a spell error. It just got one extra letter in it. That's all. And then, and then also the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew, and you mentioned uh, in the Old Testament, it gives the picture. It's it's the in the genealogy of Jesus, it gives what I would say is is from more of Joseph's line, and there's also Mary's side. So, no, we're dealing. We're not dealing with the genealogy in, in Luke. Um, we're uh, we're dealing with the one in Matthew. There's missing four of Jesus's forefathers. Like Amaziah is not in there, and there's three other names that's not mentioned in there. And if you count each of the names, Matthew made it so that each father's name is 14, and then you go to another, and it's 14, and it's 14. Equaling a total of what 40 uh, is it 42? Okay, so when you if you actually include the names that Matthew skipped out There would be more it would be like 19 on one of them Okay in the carrying away into Babylon because it skipped a hot. Let me see. Let me look at my notes real quick. It skipped And a lot of people don't know nothing about that, but I, I study I study the Bible. It miss, it's, it's missing uh, Ahaziah, Joash, Amaziah, Jehoiakim. Those names are not in Jesus Christ's genealogy, even though those are David's ancestors as well as Jesus, going all the way up to Abraham. All right, so we see that those names are missing. See, Dave, see uh, Matthew, he, made, he was trying his best to make it look flawless, I believe. Notice I said, I believe. This is just my opinion. I believe he was trying to make Jesus' birth so flawless with the 14 and the 14 and the 14. However, he missed out four names. And now I've actually submitted that question to an Israelite supposedly camp leader on top, like supposed to be big, big guy in the Bible. And even he had to tell me, oh, I'll get back with you on that one. Because he was going to try to say, well, the generations don't mean each father. But then when you do the math, it does. Each generation is a father. And in the book of Matthew, four men's names are missing. But going on, go ahead. I don't want to take it, yeah, take up your time. I, I would, yeah, no, I would just yeah, I would say that, and then also, uh, I, would, I would just say that. What do you have to say to that? You said I would probably say that it comes down to different, the different lines where there's a mother's side and a father's side, and so no, it, but that, but Matthew picture, one is talking about the son of, is talking about Joseph. You see that? In, yeah, and then in, in in the Old Testament, it would have been more for Mary's side. And so that's, what do you mean that's by from the Mary side? Everything is based on the father. The Old Testament genealogies is the genealogies of the father. The lineage comes from the father. What does the mother have to do with it? And also that after they became, think about it, Joseph's, because Jesus was born a virgin, Joseph's DNA wasn't part of Jesus's, but because Joseph was from the tribe of, uh, you know, David, Mary, then also uh, had lineage. I mean, I, I don't know. You, you, you know the you Bible says in Numbers 1, do you know what the book Bible says in Numbers 1-8? Do you know what Sorry. that says? Do you know what it says in Leviticus 15, 16? Okay, I'll give you one of them. Leviticus 15, 16, it says, um, and if any man's seed of copulation go out from him, then he shall wash all his flesh in water. Okay, so what is that saying? The seed comes from the man. The, the, the seed comes from the man. That's how it works. That's why they said the son, that's why they started with Abraham. They didn't start with Sarah. They started with Abraham. The only time they will mention a woman is in a case with Jesus or like, for instance, it, it mentions it with the twins, um, 
in the genealogy um, when they had Perez and Tamar. But for the most part, if you look through the genealogy, it's strictly males because the lineage is passed down. And we know we have scriptures in the Old Testament where God promises David from his own seed that one would come from his own loins. At that time, it was Solomon. Okay, he's talking about the male comes from the father. And this is even science. Even science will tell you this, that the children's blood comes from their father. I don't care how much it looks like it's mom. The DNA, the, 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 the real strand comes from the father. And so in that genealogy, I just wanted to know what was your explanation. So I, would, so I, would, I would say that because when Joseph and Mary got married, they became a one flesh spiritually. And so it wasn't a physical thing. It was a spiritual thing. And so the, the genealogies differ because you're getting the full picture, one in the New Testament of probably Mary's side and one in the Old Testament of Joseph's side. No. Because the spirit, the spirit, not the blood. No, no, no. Blood. But you're, but the genealogy is in chapter, blood, Luke, chapter them, is in blood. Luke 2. You know that, right? In Luke 2? It's in, the, it's in the book of Luke. Now, most people believe that Mary's genealogy is in the book of Luke. Me personally, I think they're both uh, Jesus' genealogy, but a lot of people, I debate with a lot of people and talk and have discussions with people. And if you go to the book of Luke, it has Jesus, uh, they say it's Mary's genealogy. Let me see which verse is in. It might be like Luke. Uh, let me see. It's definitely like a second, third, or fourth chapter. Let me see. Not fourth, for sure. Yeah, third, third. And that's in starting off at verse 23. When it says, Jesus himself began to be about 30 years. And then it says, which was the son of Method, son of Levi, Malchi, Jana, son of Joseph and it's mixed and it's, and, it's, and it's got a little mixed up in there and that's why some people are like oh yeah that's, that's, that's Mary's genealogy is in Luke and Jesus genealogy is in Matthew chapter 1 and this, the name um, if you look at it one of them have a name that stands out and it's Heli it says Joseph it says was the son of Heli. And that's why they say they say that was Mary's father. Okay. So that's the difference between those two genealogies is that it says Joseph was the son of Heli. But if you go to Matthew chapter one, it says that Joseph was the son of, let's see, his name was Jacob. You see that? One says Jacob, one says yeah, hold up. Yeah, absolutely. I see what you're. I see what you're saying. Yeah, that's a. You know, I mean, it's 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 tough. It's it's tough to say one way or the other. Like like that is. Yeah, absolutely. Good. And then you also mentioned books like the Apocrypha. You know, like they got the Book of Maccabees and oh, there's all sorts of. I study all those. I study that, all of that. Yeah, I mean, you know, the Book of they've got. Mary Magdalene's got a book. Judas has got a book. They've got the. Oh no, no, book no! Book I'm talking here. about the real deal, just the apocrypha. The intertestament period. Yeah, I'm talking about the apocrypha. I'm not talking about all the miscellaneous Saint Thomas and all the the you know right, Christianity has a whole bunch of books, man. They got a whole bunch of stuff. But I'm just talking about the real deal apocrypha, uh, the books that include Maccabees, Esdras, uh, Susanna, um, and then it has uh, Judith, um, the three sons, all, all those. All the ones that are in your standard 1611 King James Bible. I'm not talking about the strange stuff. I'm not talking about Enoch. I'm not talking about all that. But yeah. there's a debate because we know for a fact that there are books that are missing. Book of Wars, uh, the Book of Nathan, um, the book, the real authentic book of Jasher. Um, so we, well, you, I didn't yeah. even pull out all that on you. I didn't even go into the book. Um, the book thing because you know we already have unknown authors in the 66 books of the Bible anyway you know just with the 66 books of the Bible but yeah anything else you said you wanted this you wanted would, to say something about yeah I would say I would say also just in terms of the books like the actual um, book of Hebrews uh, 
unequivocally, I would say, was written by Paul. A lot of people, uh, just the majority have a consensus that it was Paul. But, I mean, if you look at the math, like I was saying, and it's not numerology, you know, say that it is. I'm, it's just simple addition and subtraction from numbers. It's very simple, nothing... Uh, there's no uh, extra meaning added to the math that I'm talking about. It's just it's just literally arithmetic. It's all it is. Oh, it yeah. shows patterns. So that's what I go by. It shows. And if you read the like first five books of the Torah, um, you know those were written by Moses. And then you've got the Tanakh, the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings. You've got the major prophets, and you've got all the writings. And if you take uh, all the, the books, then you have, uh, when it ends with, you know, Malachi, and then it goes into the New Testament, uh, those first five books were written by, you know, the, the four, the Synoptic Gospels, and then the Book of Acts was written by Luke, but then the next five books were written by Paul, and then the five books after that, the, the major writings of Paul in, in those first five books are one set, and then the next five books were also written by Paul. Uh, those are the minor epistles, and then, you know, the major and minors, and then also the, you know, obviously the last few books, there's five of them, and then there's the book of Revelation, which stands on its own. So those sort of, you got a five book of five, book of five, book of but, five. But the, the first book of first book, John is not Paul, though. Left. What'd you say? The book of first, the book of first John and, and, and Jude, those are not Paul. Those are not, well, no, those are written by, um, those are just extra, those are five, uh, you know, the additional books, and then the last book of the set would be uh, the Revelation, so. Yeah. You've got, you know, you've got five, 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 and then the additional writings, and then the last book is Revelation, and it's, it oh. adds up to the total amount. That's just uh, easy, sort of, if you just go by that, you can see that those sort of line up like that. And then, go ahead. Go ahead. And then you also mentioned uh, what is it that you 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 mentioned Deuteronomy as an example. It says uh, you know the father should not be the son shall not be put to death for the father. Yes. Except for, yes. And so the the argument I would make for that is Jesus was not put to death. He laid his life down. Oh. And I would think it says he was crucified. Sin. Yeah, well, he laid his life down voluntarily. He didn't die for the Father. The Father didn't sin. He died for humanity, and so he did that voluntarily. So he wasn't killed. He wasn't murdered. He Hold actually, on. No, the Bible, murdered. the Bible says he was murdered. The Bible says he was murdered, man. The Bible you says he was killed. You can't. See, see I'm not going to tell you nothing what it means. I'm not going to tell you anything of what it means. Now, Christians, y'all love, love explaining. I'm just going to show you what it says. It says that he, they slew him, whom you slew, and yeah, hung murdered. on a tree. And they caused him a murderer, okay? Not murdered. He, it he, says he, he was he, murdered. They, they didn't murder him. They, I would say he laid his life down, sacrificed his life voluntarily. He went up there of his own free will, of his own accord. He said, you have no power other than that which was given to you by my father. To do this. Well, that's and the so, case in any person being murdered. Any person everybody. that gets killed is by God's permission. Can't nobody do anything to anybody without God intervening. That's, that's how fair. it's always been. God, God is in charge. God is in charge of everything. Everything that dies is by His permission. He's the author of life. So when you when you saying oh hey, you take my life I can go up to a person right now and it's got a gun in my face and say you can't do nothing to me except what God gives you it, well, it, when it's all it's said and done can't. he murdered he was murdered the Bible well, says it have to disagree there <laughs> so you don't so you don't believe what the Bible says I think he Jesus essentially martyred himself he um, gave his life he, he gave his life I would say he wasn't murdered but he was killed. That he died, but wasn't. You, no one forced him to go to the cross. Many times he was tempted to just obfuscate the cross altogether and go around it, circumvent it. But he didn't. He did it because he wanted his blood to, you know, cover everybody's sins, and that's why he did it. So he he did it. So that's what that's what I would say, just as an explanation. 
You can accept that explanation or reject it. That's your that's your choice. But I'll just give you my side of the argument. I know, man. You you, ex- you yeah, I know, man. If you're yeah. saying that the Bible says that he was crucified, crucified means murdered, man. He they killed him. Now think about it. Now think about it. You said that, you know, Jesus said no one takes my life. How many scripture references you have on that? I'm not doing the island thing. When I showed you scriptures, I showed you two, three, and four scriptures. I'm not bringing one little scriptures, building a mountain on it. How many more, do you have more references of Jesus being crucified or him saying, no man, take my life? (laughs) Yeah, he says, I have the power to pick up my life and lay it down. How many references is what I ask? Uh, Well, I just gave you two. I don't know how many more there are. So... The Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So you should have more than one, two, three scripture. You should you shouldn't build. You can't come to an argument with one scripture. You got to have multiple. Everything is confirmed. Everything is confirmed. And in the Bible, in the New Testament, Paul is the main one talking about Jesus being crucified. I don't know how many times over 37 times the word crucified is mentioned. Crucified, crucified, crucified. Okay? From the beginning to the end, in the book of Revelations and in Matthew, it's talking about Jesus being crucified. Crucified means murder. Now, I want to know how many references you have of Jesus saying, no one takes my life, I lay it down willingly. You probably only got one. Well, I got I and got John. John. That's John it. Chapter 10, verse 18. <laughs> All you got is Joy John, man. That's one hey, scripture. Says, John John chapter 10, verse 18, no one takes it from me. And then he says also in John chapter 19, nine chapters later, you'd have no authority of me over me other than that which was given to you from above. And he says it, he says it in many other uh, ways and specifically. That's the same author. That's the same author, man. Many Christians would agree with me that Jesus was murdered, man. He was cursed. He was hung on a tree. He was made sin. He was sacrificed. He was killed, man. Wh- wh- which way you want me to put it? That's what they say. He was murdered. He was slew. He was hung on a tree. He was crucified. Okay? He was cursed. He was absolutely cursed. But I mean, that's what y'all say. I don't believe that garbage. I don't believe, I don't believe, I don't believe that garbage. I believe God took him alive. I believe the exact same thing with Joseph. Joseph was not murdered. It was a big lie. It was a big lie. And and I believe in types and shadows. And I believe that Joseph's story was a picture of Jesus Christ. He was not murdered. Jesus said for three days and three nights, I will be alive. Just like Jonah was. It looked like Jonah died. But Jonah did not die. He said that three. He said he will. He said that. Just like Jonah, three days and three nights. Okay, that's that's all New Testament. That's the leaven of the Pharisees. That's the leaven of the Pharisees. All that teaching that Jesus rose from the grave, all that stuff is the Pharisees' belief. Paul was the son of a Pharisee. He was taught by Gamaliel. They all agreed in the book of Matthew that one man should die for the nation. The the people were saying, crucify him, let his blood be on our children. All that stuff is against the Old Testament. God said, no man, nobody, no, no son is going to pay for nobody else's sins. Everybody is going to be held accountable for their own sins. Now you have to say... Take, tear that out your Bible. Just tear those pages out. Tear out Ezekiel, Samuel, Deuteronomy, the book of Kings, the book of Malachi. It is all talking about each person being responsible for their own sins. Paul is the only one in the New Testament in Romans chapter 5 that teaches generational curses. He teaches that we all die because of Adam or we're all going to live because of Christ. The Christian is a robot. He doesn't have a choice. According to Paul's teachings, because Paul teaches generational curses or generational blessings. Either way you put it, he, pe- he teaches that if we believe in Christ, we will live, that God will save our wicked asses because of one righteous man. And in the Old Testament, God is saying, no, the righteous man is not going to die. He's going to live according to his righteousness. So those are the differences between the Old Testament and the New Testament. All right. 
I, I understand, yeah, you, and you made a lot of those points, even, um, like, in Romans, uh, what is it, you, just, you were mentioning... Romans uh, 5. Yeah, that uh, basically, uh, you know, he says that the righteous, you're, you're saying in Daniel and Job, it says the righteous will live, but in the book of Romans it says that that um, Abraham, others, like you're saying Job and Daniel, those would be, you know, part of that group that I'm going to mention, is that they were righteous according to perfect. their faith. God, Jesus said be perfect, and, and God told Abraham to be perfect. Yeah, we were told to be they, perfect. They were righteous, but I don't, I don't believe that they were perfect, because Moses, like, he struck the rock, he wasn't able to enter the, the land of the promised land, and uh, Abraham, he had uh, done it with Sarah, and they just had Ishmael, and also, you know... Hold on, hold on, hold on. What was more justifiable, for him to sleep with Sarah or Hagar? I, well, I think God wanted him to wait, but it ended up working out that he slept with... Uh, with, uh, you know, Sarah. Sarah was his own sister. Or ha Hagar, That's incest. Rather. That's incest in the Bible. Yeah, I don't... According to Leviticus 18, you cannot sleep with your own sister. Yeah, and you I, cannot I sleep with your, your... You cannot look upon your... Any, any sibling, like for instance, Jacob, according to the book of Moses, he was not allowed to sleep with two sisters. You could not get two women pregnant according to the law of Moses you can't get two sisters pregnant you can't sleep with two sisters you can't sleep with your sister Moses he was born from his his dad was his uncle okay the the nation of Israel have a lot of incest a lot of incest so you're telling me it was more justifiable for him to sleep with his his sister than for him to sleep with a woman that's not related to him that God said he was going to bless and make a great nation, and we have Islam today? Was Sarah his sister? Yes, Sarah was his blood sister. I didn't know that, but that's I, why I, he I, told I, her. He that's why he told the man, he said, this is my sister. She's not my he, wife, she is my sister. He was not lying, he was telling the truth. He just wasn't telling the whole truth. Right, right. That was his yeah. sister. Yeah, it, well... It, yeah. well, no, I think it's the opposite. I think it, isn't it the other way around that he said it's his sister, but it was his wife? No, and, no, it was his sister because who is who is Sarah's dad? So you got to study your Bible. You got to study your Bible. I don't know, man. Terah or Terah, T E R A H. Terah was her father, and guess who was Abraham's father? Terah. They both had the same father. According to the law of Moses, you cannot have sex with anybody that has the same father as you. That's why it was before the law of Moses. Okay? Because even Moses, his dad was his uncle. But if you look back at the whole thing, if you look at the whole matter, Hagar was more honorable for him to sleep with. That's why the first time an angel is mentioned in the Bible is with who? Um, the first time an angel came on the Bible and talked to anybody, who was it? Was it? Was it? Uh, it wasn't Jacob. Oh, he was much before that. Uh, yep. Well, you, you, would, you would know. What is it? Yes. Let's have a little fun. Guess. Abraham. Nope. Hagar. The first two times an angel ever came on the scene is with Hagar. And amazing, that's the same testimony of our prophet, peace be upon him. And he was met by the angel Gabriel. The angel always followed the nation of Ishmael from the beginning. So when you look at the honorable status, I mean, you might believe that Sarah was more honorable. I mean, that's according to your belief. And I honestly believe that Hagar was more honorable for him to sleep with since it wasn't his uh, sister. I mean, would you, would you, would you actually get your, your sister pregnant if you have the same dad? You wouldn't do that. You wouldn't do that today. So today, it would be more honorable to just mess with this Egyptian woman. She's not related to me at all. <laughs> you know what I mean? Looking yeah. back at it, that's just how I feel. I don't know how you feel about it. <laughs> no, I mean, 
I was just trying to make the point that, you know, Abraham wasn't, was, did things that were unrighteous. And I was also going to say that if, if he was doing things, it was according to faith and what God called him to do. Um, but it was, uh, yeah, I, I mean, you what did he do that, that was unrighteous? I mean, he, he, well, God told him to, I think, have a nation with Sarah and he instead started with uh, Hagar. No, he didn't. God didn't tell him that he couldn't have a multiple wife. In the law of Moses, they were allowed to have multiple wives. Yes. Okay, and, so and he so didn't do nothing wrong. He just, he listened to his wife. His wife wanted to have an heir. So he did the right thing. His wife was okay with it. So if your wife is telling you can ha you can have another woman, then that's telling you, you know, she's okay. And then they were financially stable. He could take care of both of them. So he did... He didn't do nothing wrong. He didn't do anything wrong by sleeping with Hagar. Abraham and, was blessed. He had a lot of gold to take care of multiple women. Yes. And that was, but that, that wasn't, the, the original design, you know, wasn't, it was just one man, one woman. No, person. that's all Paul. Paul is the only one that teaches that one man is supposed to have one wife. Nobody else said that. God never it changed the multiple wives in the Old Testament. He said, if you have, he said if a man has two wives, he must make sure that he takes care of them both equal. That's the law, man. That's your Bible. Paul, Paul was the gentleman, my guy. Paul was the, what a girl wants, what a girl needs. That was Paul, man. He introduced that law to us, man. <laughs> In the no, I, Paul did not introduce. Who, that was okay. Introduced. Show me where it says one wife, one man. Sure. It, the the whole when when Jesus came to the tomb, he was mistook for a gardener because he's restoring the Garden of Eden. So my evidence is no, that no. That's it, that's yes. typology. You know, most Christians won't even agree with you. You're doing that's typology. Right. You got to say, well, at say, least that's how you believe. But when he came to the Garden of Gethsemane, that wasn't have anything to do about marriage. That had nothing to do. That, that The context was not marriage. It was Mary seeing Jesus, okay, in the tomb, which is a, another contradiction I don't even want to go into about who seen Jesus first and all that. <laughs> but what I want to say is, according to the Bible, on that topic, who gave laws on marriage? God originally gave laws on marriage. And then who else gave laws on marriage? Paul is the only other person who gave laws on marriage. And that's seen in Corinthians chapter 11. He talks about the law of marriage. It's actually seen in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Okay, he talks about it, you know, and he talks about one wife, um, a wife is supposed to have one husband and one husband is supposed to have one wife. He gave us that law in Christianity. Nowhere well, else, no, but no one else. He's the only I, one. Well, I would say that there is truth to that. However, it, Jesus does speak. He says in, uh, I think it's Matthew, he just says, Matthew you, 19. Why, that walk, he says, is a man allowed to give his uh, wife a, a, a you know, certificate of divorce? And, and, and Jesus says, in the old days, because of the hardness of people's hearts and everything that was going on, God had his plans. He said he let people get divorces. He let that happen. But he said, that is not the way it was from the beginning. He says that. So it actually is. That's Jesus. not talking about multiple wives. That's talking about divorce, man. You got to stay in context. But, but, says, but I agree. But he also says that's not how it was from the beginning, which is from the beginning, Adam's sons had multiple wives. Okay? From the beginning, Adam's sons had multiple wives. Before they fell. There is not was not set that way. There's not one scripture where God tells you you can't have two wives. Brother, I'm nowhere. Saying you gotta connect the dots. Nowhere. He, he tells you you can. He doesn't give a commandment, but he and you know what? And you know what? what? That's a whole nother topic. We're we're getting off big time. You know, if yeah. you want to look at a story about a gardener and you want to go by what Jesus <laughs> said about divorce and you want to interpret it that way, but I even believe someone who is just want to stay with the scriptures if you really deal with the Bible. God gave laws on marriage, and then Paul came, and he gave laws on marriage. 
That's it. Issue. That's it, man. We shouldn't be confused about something like that. We shouldn't have to look through a, a meaning and a story. What about the children? The children don't have that type of education. A child just needs to be taught something simple, plain. Just give them the milk. Give them the basics. God taught about marriage. And guess who else taught about marriage? Paul taught about marriage. No one else. No one else. There's a, there's a lot of milk in the Bible, but it says also there's a lot of meat in the Bible. And so some all some that is Paul, man. That, that is that is Hebrews. That's an unknown author who talks about the meat of the word and the milk of the word. The author is unknown, although you said every word in the Bible is perfect. How is an author going to be unknown? That that, then, that doesn't make sense, man. Well, it also mentions in Hebrews about Timothy, which was one of Paul's, you know, most faithful, uh, you know, disciples under himself because he was an apostle. You know, spawning many disciples. So that's more evidence. And there's other. What it says about things. Timothy in Hebrews? Mentions his name one, one time at the end, I believe. Uh, it's something about him, Timothy. And that, that it's not absolute proof that Paul wrote it, but it is uh, a suggestion. It is suggestive that uh, it, it actually uh, shows a connection to Paul. Timothy he, is mentioned in the book of Hebrews? I believe so. I'm actually verify. Let me do. I think towards the end. I, I would. I would have to just. Yeah. Uh, honestly. Okay. Yeah. I see what you're saying. You're talking about in. You're talking about Hebrews thirteen twenty three twenty five, where it says, "Written to the Hebrews from Italy by Timothy." That don't even make sense. So you're saying Timothy? <laughs> I want you to know our brother Timothy has been released. If he arrives soon, I will come with him to see you. You know, I mean, that's that's a mention of Timothy right there. Right. But you know, Paul put his signature supposedly on his letters. He'll say written by Paul by my own hand. So, yeah, you know, that's questionable, man. That's questionable. And then also... um. You mentioned a couple of other things. That were well, I get to ask. Do I get to ask you some questions too? Because I want to ask you some stuff. Absolutely. If you've Go got ahead. a question, Go ahead. fire it at me. I'll, I'll, I'll answer it right now. Unless right. you want me to ask you a question, I'll. I'll. You. You ask me a question. All right. Now you said that in the Quran it says that the Bible is true. Where does it say that the Bible is true? I now I know it tells us that he came to confirm the Torah and the Gospels and it talks about um, us, you know, the book. But it don't say that every, it doesn't say that the Bible is true. It just lets us know that we have the previous scriptures because it also talks about in the Quran about people writing lies. And we know he's talking about the Jews. Yeah, so, I, so if I said that the Quran said that the Bible is true, I would say that I would only have said that from deductive reasoning. Because if, for instance, the um, Word of God is the Bible, and the Word of God is the Quran, and then it talks about the people of the book in many instances in the Quran, and God's Word cannot be corrupted, and God cannot lie, then if it refers to the people of the book, it says, believe them, whatever it says in that Quran verse and chapter and verse. I don't. I would, I would have to look it up. But it would. It would basically, in essence, just deducing that if if the Bible was false, then God would be a liar. So I'm not saying that the Quran says explicitly okay. the Bible is true. Right. Just, just that the fact God cannot lie. How can the Bible be corrupted if God cannot lie? Or how can the the Bible have lies in it if God cannot be corrupted? So. I would say the Bible's true because the Bible's uncorrupted, and the Quran is uh, basically written by men. Okay. That's, that's what I would say. All right. Well, I want to ask you a question. All right. I got two more. It says in Jeremiah 8.8 8, that your scribes written lies, and you're telling me that the Bible don't have no corruption? When God Almighty is correcting the scribes from writing lies in Jeremiah 8.8, 8, Read Jeremiah 8, 8, and verse 9, and then tell me what that means. Let me read it. Jeremiah 8, 8. Let's, let's start from the beginning of the chapter. So, 
always get context. But time to praise the Lord. So 8 8. How can you say we are wise for we have the law of the Lord when actually the lying pen of the scribes has handled it falsely? So, um, yeah. yeah, the one. So, yeah, that's an interesting verse. Let me read it again. How can you say we are wise for we have the law of the Lord when actually the lying pen of the scribes has handled it falsely? Now, read 9. <laughs> That is a very interesting verse, but I don't know. I mean, I, I, I could give you a sort of... Uh, you got to read verse 9 with it, too. It, the wise will be put to shame. They will be dismayed and trapped since they've rejected the word of the Lord. What kind of wisdom do they have? I mean, if I was going to say, it always comes back to, you know, like, for instance, the scribes and the Pharisees were always saying, okay, well, if, if you uh, have... For, you know, they're like the lawyers. They're always trying to find, like, loopholes. They'll say, like, well, God said this... But if, for instance, you know, you shall not, you, should, you have to give gifts. But if you give the gift on the altar, it counts. If you give the gift not on the altar, it doesn't count. And they made up extra rules to try to, like, circumvent the law. So I think it's actually a reference to, like, what the scribes and the Pharisees were doing from when the prophets were being killed in the Old Testament and also in the New Testament when they were also killing Jesus and, you know, killing all the disciples. The, the, the scribes and Pharisees were just looking for loopholes. So I would say... It, it refers more to them, like, trying to, like, you know, bend the rules than it is an, an, an out, outright, um, you know, just completely disregard of the, of the text or of saying that, you know, there's, there's potential corruption in the words okay. of God. I think it, it's more about man's interpretation of the words than it is about, an, you know, an, ex, an exact, you know, oh, you should be dubiously questioning all these words that we're reading because they were written by men. Uh, you know, I think it's more about loopholes. That would be my interpretation. Okay, um, so so when let me ask you a question: Have you ever read that scripture in that light like that before? I have not. I've never read that scripture in that light. All right, and and also with that being said, um, was Paul a Pharisee and a scribe? He, he he was. He was a Pharisee. He said he was a Pharisee's Pharisee, and he when they went to stone Stephen. He handled their coats so that they could get a better throw on their rocks because the coats were too heavy. So he like collected. He was like the coat, the coat, uh, you know, man. And they were just they stoned Stephen to death. So he and he he he, he, he approved that. of that murder. Now now now, guy, I'm gonna tell you the truth, man. You've been nice. You've <laughs> been nice. You've been nice. You've actually. I'll tell you the truth, man. I've been debating a lot of guys, and there's one other guy. Um. He believes in um, the Israelite movement, and but he believes that Jesus died um, for his sins. And the thing is, he was probably one of the other nice people. That was nice. Like a lot of the guys were 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 very, very, very rude. And I'll okay. give that to you. I'll give credit where credit is due. Even though we have disagreements, I'll say you're pretty nice. But I want to say to you. I want to say to you. The story of Stephen has a whole lot of meaning in it. And I believe, notice I said I believe, I believe that that story is a picture of Jesus' murder. If you look at the way he died, it's similar to the way of the Gospels account on how they say Jesus died. And we see that Paul approved of that murder. Now I'm going to ask you another question. Is it true? That out of all the apostles, Paul teaches about Jesus being crucified more than all of them. Yes. Okay. And with that being said, um, like I said, I've been a Christian for 20 years and I came to Christ I came to Christianity from the Bible. I was in prison, okay, and I and I was just I would just sit on my bunk and read 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 i probably read the bible probably about over 30 times back and forth and i'm not just talking about reading i'm talking about with my dictionary looking up words and all that now i've been a christian for probably about 20 years not just in the church but i've been a bible teacher for 15 years i used to always get the opportunity to teach i used to teach prisoners when they came out of jail and all of that now i'm in islam now i'm in islam now nobody pressured me nobody pushed me no person at all i just 
I just came there from studying the Bible. I just started seeing things in the Bible. And you might disagree with that, but I just wanted to tell you my testimony. So I know how it is to have that zeal for Christ and, 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 and to always reconcile every error you find in the Bible. Every sort of mistake, just like right now. You never really looked at that scripture in Jeremiah. But by defense, because you want to defend the gospel and you want to believe what's true. You're by nature, by nature, you're going to reconcile every disagreement that we have with the Bible. And the apologetics or the apologists, I call them uh, apologists because they always apologize for every obvious error. It could be a simple error as, okay, Jehoiakim was eight years old and then Jehoiakim is 18 years old. It's an apparent lie. And, and, I'm, not, and I'm not saying it's an, uh, like a downright lie, but what I'm trying to show you is from Jeremiah chapter 8. He was talking about their errors. He was talking about them writing lies. And there's, there's many more. There's many more on Solomon's temple and certain measurements. There's a whole bunch of errors that the apologists uh, try their best to reconcile. All I can say is that, young man, I encourage you uh, to continue to study. Continue to study the Bible and um, like I said, I study the Bible every night. Even though I'm in Islam, I have an exhortation every day. I try to do an exhortation every day on my channel and I come out of the Bible because I want to reach people that are in the Bible, okay? Because not only am I a Muslim, okay, but I started off as a Christian, so... I know a lot of scriptures and I and I and I and I just see a lot of different things in there. But with that being said, uh um I want to get off of here about 4:30 my time so I can get into my prayer, but we still have time and I only got one more question for you and um like I said regardless if we disagree, it's okay. The most important thing is respect and you pass that test. You pass that test um, by being respectful, and I pray that I pass the test by being respectful, because that's those are the most important things, because that's what's going to help um, promote either one of our messages, our character. It's the it's our character that is going to reach people how we act. And my last question for you is. Deuteronomy 23 19 it says and I showed you three scriptures from three different authors where it says God is not a man what you think about that if you're saying Jesus is God and the Bible is saying God is is not man what do you how do you uh, reconcile that yeah I you know the a lot of the, uh, a lot of, so when all through the lineage of Jesus, he had to be, you know, incarnated, born into a body uh, so that he could shed his blood. But God doesn't have blood because God is invisible. God is not, not even inside time. Uh, you know, it's like he's formless, he's matterless, uh, he's shapeless. God, God can't uh, shed blood. God's not like a human. But Jesus, it's, it says that he humbled himself, taking on the likeness of a man. And so it's a bit, it's, the Bible admits it. The Bible says it's Paul a is the one who teaches that, and I believe that's in Philippians. Yeah, in Philippians, yeah. Yeah, I know yeah, what you're and, talking about. So I would say, yeah, I would say, it, I would say God is 100% God and 100% man. And that's, that's how I would justify it. Now, I know that it's up to 200%. But because there's there's a divine nature to God, and there's also um, a human nature when he was filled, when he's, his spirit entered a body, and essentially, and the, you know, God is, is three persons, but one essence, like, like I try to just explain it like water. I've heard all that, you know, I've been a Christian right. 20 years, vapor, gas, yeah. solid, I've I heard all of those explanations, oh, wow. and I disagree with a trinity. 
I know that that Trinity verse um, is not in most modern Bibles because it actually was added. It's not in the Synodicus, which you, I'm glad that you mentioned, is not in the original. And there's no such thing as the word Trinity. And only thing, I'm going to let you speak, I'm going to let you speak. The only thing I encourage you to do is if you're going to say something, say you believe. But when you say that God doesn't have blood and you don't have no scripture for it, then all you're doing is you're just saying your beliefs. You're not, what you're saying is not hanging on to any scripture. So what can you say that is hanging on to scripture that God is a man. Sure. So, well, well before, before I answer that, because I kind of semi-answered it, maybe not adequately, but I would say that even you, uh, you know, you have a hand and a leg and a, and a head and a, and a body, and you also have a spirit, and you, you know, we're mind, body, and spirit. You also have mind, intelligence, and, and your, your spirit is invisible, you can't see it, but actually is very important. Your soul slash spirit is very real, but you can't see it. And also, you know, it, it's, it's essentially because you're made in the image of God, it's infinite, but you, your soul, your spirit is in a body right now. And if you lose your hand because you're not just your body, you don't become less of yourself because you're beyond just a body. You know, you're, you'd be a body without a hand, but you're still you. You don't lose part of yourself because yourself is more than just your body. It's your spirit slash soul and your mind. So we're made in the image of God. So the best way I could explain the nature of God is to explain how we are mind, body, and spirit. And is that as a reference because there's no real other way to show an analogy other than through what God has created us to be. And... Uh, that's the best explanation I could give. I, I, it, it's not a perfect one because, like I said, if you tried to explain this to a Martian or some, some other you know, being from another universe, you couldn't do it. They'd say, well, you, know, you're, you are your hand. If you lose your hand, you lose part of yourself. But then you explain to them, no, no, I have a spirit. They're like, well, where's your spirit? And you can't tell them because it's not material. So, like, I can't explain the nature of God any better than I can explain our own nature except that we experience our nature and... God, he came into a body, and that was Jesus, just like we are made in the image of God. Now, it says that you, ye are gods, but ye will die like men, because we've sinned and God didn't sin. So that's the difference, really, about the difference between God and man, is God is all-powerful and honestly ethical. Man, we've used our free will, unlike God, who also has free will, since we're made in his image, but God never sinned, he never used his free will. Errantly, man has, and so we're going to die. Okay. Uh, the, so that's what I would say. Just it, that's the best. And, and it's, in terms of scripture, because I get a little off track, uh, talking too much. It says uh, the immaterial God. Um, it's Second Corinthians chapter four, verse sixteen. Uh, Though outwardly man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Which I, that's not the verse. Uh, it, it's it's um it's a verse about um, the immaterial nature of God. So I, I would You're say talking that about First Corinthians fifteen, um, talking about celestial beings or what? Um, it might be there. I know that I've read that in the Bible it says God is immaterial. It says that somewhere. I don't know exactly where, so um, I don't want to. Okay. But it says it's, it mentions it. But then, obviously, Jesus was a man, so yeah. that's like, yeah. Obviously, how can a man be God? If God's immaterial, but then again, how if something's immaterial, can you ever come to truly know it unless you know it reveals itself? God, Jesus is God revealed, but He also is God in essence. It's, it's right. I mean, that's, I, it's, I disagree, that's but I'm letting you explain it. Right. I'm right. letting that's you explain it. Uh, Romans explain. one talks about um, Paul, and I call Paul. I believe he's a hypocrite. I believe that all the time that Jesus was talking about Pharisees, he ultimately was talking about Paul. Now, in Romans chapter 1, Paul says something about... He, he actually... He says that Jesus is the co-creator, that God created all things with Jesus Christ and all that stuff. But then he goes on and says a hypocritical scripture right here. 
This probably was the scripture you was looking for. Romans chapter 1 verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse because that when they knew God they glorified him not as God neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened professing themselves to be wise they became fools now this is what I believe Christianity has done it says and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. So basically you're saying God is a man. And I have, I have messages. I have a whole message on the hypocrisy of Paul. And, and right there, this is the strongest verse in the Bible against idolatry. It's coming from the same person who tells us that God is a man. The same person who tells us that God created the whole world with Jesus Christ. So when you look at that scripture, he is literally getting on people for changing the glory of the uncorruptible God. And I'm curious to see, hear what it says in your version of the Bible. But it says he changed the glory of the uncorruptible God. And I just want to stop at man into an image man, like into the image of a man. What is that about? Yeah, I mean, I would read the New International Version, but I, I have a parallel version, Living Greek New Testament. Let me just okay. pull it up there, and because uh, this is my my go-to for making sure I have the words that are originally what was written. Okay. So this is uh, verse 20. Really, it's actually 23. And they changed the glory of the immortal God. Immortal! Into a, Woo! Immortal. It's immortal. Uh oh, I like your version better right on that part. What does immortal mean? Not mortal. It's Can I die? Yeah. Eternal. Form of an image of corruptible man and birds and four footed animals and crawling creatures. Like a lamb, yeah. an animal. So here's so here's what I would say, and this is my well like a lamb, but it, it, here's what I would say just as a response is that when Jesus uh, died uh, you know, he was, like you're saying, he was mortal, but actually, he, I guess you would have to say that he died, but he also was not mortal, because he rose from the dead, and he's walked well, around. That's he, what he you left believe. He had his hands in his wounds, and appeared to the apostles, with, not only at the supper table multiple times, but at the fish, when they collected the fish, and so he was not really mortal. He just, like... I don't want to say like pseudo mortal because he died, but he died and then he was alive again. So it's like, how could you kill him? You know, maybe, I mean, I, I suppose he would have had to have died, but then it, if he died, he resurrected. And does that mean he's mortal or immortal? You know, if you inspect it through that lens, I can't be sure. I, I don't know. I, I mean, I would say, I would say he's immortal, but then that would negate him dying. So maybe, Maybe just, maybe just what we would understand death to be. I, I don't know. I that's that's right. the best explanation I could give. That's I don't know. You're getting the, you know. So because he rose from the dead and he's he's walking. Well, he could he could appear in the room before you right now if he wanted to. Just, you know, according to the fact that he is alive and he appeared to the apostles and the you know disciples after his death. Yeah, according to the gospel accounts, they say. He appeared to them, but there's a lot of different contradictions and we don't have time because it says he told them to stay in Jerusalem. And then he also, in another gospel account, tells them to go into Galilee. He would meet them in Galilee. And, you know, in the whole thing with the New Testament, it's just, it's stories. It's not necessarily like the Old Testament when the prophets would be like, thus saith the Lord. It, it, there's no, like, audible, like, uh, messages from God when you look at the gospels and I truly believe that the four gospels are all anonymous and I believe that John the last gospel we received according to history the last gospel we have is the most um where Jesus is mostly deified 
Um, it's like his divinity grew from the first book, Mark, to John. But going into that, um, the Gospels, to me, I believe there's stories. I believe there's things in there. But I do believe that there's discrepancies such as who carried Jesus' cross, Simon the Cyrene, or in the Gospel of John, it says Jesus carried it by himself. So the thing is, when I, when I look at that scripture, all I can do is go by what it says. I can't do the meaning stuff. I can tell you what I think it means, but that's not that's not really valid. The most I can go off is what it says. And Paul is saying that God is immortal. That means God can't die. Jesus did not know the hour. Okay, so however you put it, the Christians have more than one God. Because I know they believe in God the Father. Jesus said his Father was greater than him. Jesus said none is good but his Father. So we know that if you're saying Jesus is God, then that means... Um, even though you, you could say they're one, like I can be one with my company. That don't mean I'm the CEO. I'm one with my job, but that doesn't mean I own the job just because I have the same mind as my job. So there's many different, like when people throw out their meanings, every, everybody else has different meanings too. But what I can do is go by what it says. And what it says three times by three different prophets is God is a man. And God cannot die. So how, I mean, when they called Jesus the son of, when Jesus said he was, when they, when they said you the son of God, didn't he say, well, you guys are gods too. And we know that the Bible says men die. So when Jesus died, you're saying that you don't really know if he was really mortal or immortal. Since he rose from the dead, we know Elijah went to heaven. We went to Enoch. Went to, we know Enoch went to heaven. I don't believe they're God. I mean, you know. So the difference between their situation is that Jesus supposedly rose from the grave, and therefore that makes him God or the firstborn of every creature. To me, all that is a lot of confusion for a child. I mean, I believe a child would be really, really confused with that. I think for a child, for you to say either Jesus is God or not would be better. And I truly believe that Jesus was a prophet. He was a messenger. And he never once wanted anybody to worship him. He never once tell, no, told nobody to worship him. And I think... The same thing that happens when people die, what they do, they make up all these lies. Oh, she was an angel. Oh, she was the sweetest person. And if you notice, that's just something we as human beings do. We put a lot of salsa on the taco. We put a lot of cream on the taco, rather. We put a, we put a lot of exaggeration into things. And I believe the story of Jesus was exaggerated, my brother. And... That was just my opinion, and I, I actually, well, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that everything is exaggerated. I would say that some, some things are, I would say, exaggerated. In, in for instance, in, in some of the, the references in Revelation, talks about a dragon being thrown out of heaven. I don't know if a literal dragon is thrown out of heaven, and Jesus does use parables, and those are. If you look at the definition, false story is meant to tell a purpose. So I'm not saying God is lying according to the Bible, but instead that those parables were, they had a purpose. And there are, I think when it says utterly destroyed in the Old Testament, I don't think that's always meaning literally they wiped everybody out. Because then a chapter later you read, there were some people and they, the, the women came out of the fields and the men, you know, uh, you know had, uh, you know, did it with them. So it's like... Well, I thought they killed all those people. So there's people left over. What happened here? Well, it's a, I think it's a, it, it does, the Bible does use some exaggeration. So I mean, but to, you to pick and choose that, your exaggerations, right? Because I, I can't I use those. I, I, I can't honest, use them on Jesus' right. death. You don't believe. You believe that's literal. You believe Jesus is God. You believe that's literal. You're not going to use those exaggerations right there. So it's a game of pick yeah. and choose, right? It, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I guess so. And and <laughs> I, I mean, that's yeah, I, you know. I gotta just, I gotta be honest, that's true, but I'll tell you that even in the book of Acts, like you're saying that the Lord never commanded anything, it says in Acts chapter 10, starting at verse 9, uh, about Peter's vision, it says, uh, 
you know, he felt into a trance. Mm -hmm. So heaven opened up like a large sheet being let down to the earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then the voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. So he says, surely not. I've never eaten anything impure. So this is where, and then you read down as Simon, uh, what is it? Uh, do, do not call anything impure. And then uh, basically he, he gets commanded by God to, you know, do away with some of the Old Testament laws, you know. No, but, no, 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 no. Oh, oh, that's a whole different topic, I man. <laughs> I don't know. I know. We I keep the dietary law. That he's he's talking about going thing. to the Gentiles. He never once specifically gave a dietary law, man. Now, that, now that's going into, I do not eat pork, and, you know, that's going into a whole nother, like you said, that's the way you're interpreting he never once said, look, Peter, it's lawful for you to eat pork. When I was a Buddhist, I didn't eat any uh, meat for 15 years, just about. Dang. And so I know, I know that I, I've had dietary restrictions. And, but it's the, it, I mean, the way that I'd, I'd break it down is that, you know, the, uh, you know, the Old Testament, there were absolute moral laws, like the Ten Commandments, but also there were the Mosaic laws, where it was more for, tr you know, tribal or, you know, purposes of getting them through the wilderness and then a lot of the new testament new covenant um god comes in and he says i'm going to do a new thing and i know you're going to say that's where not what scripture is that i'm going to do a new thing with the dietary laws I'm man do a new thing. <laughs> I, yeah, you know, yeah i would have to i would have to skip forward okay yeah god, god does god does uh you know I mean, he doesn't change the absolute moral rules, but some of the the the, the like, you know laws of, of of the you know judges at the time and things like that. Not all of them, I would say, are absolute. I think some of them were, uh, you know, like I said, tribal in nature. You know, different you know type of law. You know, I don't want to get into weeds too much. Okay. You know, without 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 enough su supporting evidence, because like you said, where does God say I'm going to do a new thing? So <laughs> I have to bring up a lot of scripture to support it. I don't have it all at the at the at my fingertips. Well, but well, I, well I, check I this out, man. Good. My phone. Well, go ahead, man. My phone is about to die. I don't want to make. I want to make sure it don't die on you. Um, hold on, real quick. Hey, babe, yeah. bring me my charger. All right, go ahead, man. Yeah, I was going to say in uh, the book of um, Deuteronomy, when they kill the three... Th oh, yeah, that was going to say also in Exodus. But in Deuteronomy, he, they, they worship the golden calf. 3,000 people die uh, when Moses says, okay, the ones who separated themselves and we, you know, the people are on my side, go kill the people in the tents. And then they killed, they said, about 3,000 people or, some, or so. And then in the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit comes, it says that day 3,000 people were saved. And also in the book of Exodus. Yeah, I heard of that. Joseph Prince teaches that type of stuff. I, I, man, I heard all those messages, man. Yeah, There's a lot. You can get lost in a lot of metaphors and meanings and different things like that. And that's why when I say those things, I say, notice, this is what I believe. I still want to deal with the actual um, scripture for people um, because that gives them... Um, the authenticity of the scripture. I mean, you can look at a scripture and say, well, that's talking about that. I can look at a scripture and says, well, that's talking about that. Like, for instance, Isaiah 53, the Jewish community is talking about that's just the nation of Israel. That's not talking about an individual. Israel is the servant of God because God never made it simple and plain in those dark sentences. And you know, the Old Testament is the most difficult books to read the prophets are the most difficult why because they're dark sentences and i don't believe there's one person on the planet who can go through every prophet's prophecy and specifically tell you what it means it's a dark sentence but with moses moses is very plain god spoke plainly to moses and moses whatever moses brought out is simple you can just look at it and it says do this why because he had to teach it to children so the dark sentences, Isaiah, all those things, man, those things are not very clear. Okay, so that's why I ask, like, if you could show me a scripture where God says verbatim, you know, Jesus died for your sins, where is that? 
All you can do is go to a scripture and elude something and elude something. And you know what? We all have a right to believe what we want to believe. But I just want people to be honest. Like, hey, be honest. Hey, it's not in the Old Testament. Gee, God never once said it like that. But this is what I believe. And a lot of Christians, they don't. They, they will literally take a tent peg and literally drive it through your skull and will try to force you to believe that this is talking about Jesus when it don't say it. It don't if, say it, <laughs> you know? If you want my personal opinion, I don't think most Christians are really Christians. I mean, if you want to look at what the Bible says specifically, and I'm just going to tell you this, uh, this is my experience from seeing near-death experiences. I think if you take, how many people in the world are Christians? Let's say 30% of the world, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, just about. So let's say 70% of the world is, according to the Bible, going to hell. Now, you've got that 30%, let's say Let's say about 10% you take off because they haven't repented of their sins. They're still living a lifestyle of sin. Well, then that's about 20% of the people that are actually going to make it to heaven. Then you take another 10% off because those people don't have the Holy Spirit. They don't have any relationship with God. So you got about 10 people left. And then out of that last 10%, how many people are actually doing good works for the kingdom? Like giving their money to the poor. I know a lot of greedy Christians. They Selling everything they have them. and giving to the Selling poor. Selling everything. Right, so let's say... I, in my opinion, I think only roughly 2.5% of the entire world is actually going to make it to heaven on those criteria. And you have to have the Holy Spirit, you have to have, uh, you know, doing good works, you have to repent, and you have to have faith. Those four things you need to enter heaven, and I believe that a very, very dismally small number of people are actually going to enter into the kingdom of heaven, just based on what the Bible teaches. All right, man, I'm calling you because this other phone is dying. So just answer that. All right, go ahead. You know that, yeah. So, I get what you're saying on that. Go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of phony Christians, a lot of people that call themselves Christians, they've never read the Bible. Um, they have, uh, you know, anger. They, and you know, the, you'll have people, apologists, Christian apologists, play as an atheist in front of a congregation of people, and all those Christians will start to insult and demean that person. Then the person comes out and says, "I'm not an atheist. I actually am a Christian apologist." And then he shows them how little they know about their Bible. I think a lot of Christians, they're in name only. They don't have the Holy Spirit or anything like that. So it's, uh, you know, it's just kind of the way it is. I, I just encourage people, you know, just, just I read the word and I just put my, you know, information out there. And I just let people just, you know, figure what they, what they will based on that. And just, you know, that's all I can do. So, and it's just, just, uh. And, and uh, that's about it. I, I, can, I can mention other references too. Okay. You know. Well, that's what I'm going to do is, because we just reached the end of our thing, I'm going to post this up. Um, and I can post it on my page and then I can send you a copy of the video. Um, I definitely wanted you to be able to reach your um, um, crowd of people and the same thing with mine and I'll let you speak your mind freely and you brought out a lot of different interesting points uh, for your crowd and what I'm going to do is I'm going to post this it's probably going to take um, probably about probably about four or five hours um, because I still have a video to edit but I will edit it and then if you get text messages I'll send you the link and I'll send you the, the uh, actual invitation to the the Google Drive so you can download it as well, all right? Awesome. What's your you people? You want me to just play people? All right. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm going to do is right now we're going to have a, we're just going to, uh, like I said, and uh, what we can do in the future, since you're very respectful, you can find the topic next time. And um, we'll do one on that topic whenever you're ready. Just give me about a week. That way I can study up on it. And... I I had so much, so many notes. I would love to just organize them better. I really, just, you know, yeah, I would, I would definitely come back. Well, I would love a much more specific, you know, conversation. Okay. Just, uh, well, Riston, it's been a blessing. It's been a pleasure uh, having this discussion with you. Uh, very peaceful. Uh, love to do this again. And uh, you can pick the topic. All right, my brother. All right. Sounds good. Appreciate it. All right. Very, very, very illuminating. Thank you. Yep.